Welcome, Drink with James, episode 162. It is 9.30 in the a.m. on a Monday morning. I am back from Bangladesh. I'm going to talk more on that later. I am severely jet lagged. Uh, I woke up at three this morning, so I have, I have, this is like mid-afternoon for me. Um, look, while I was in Bangladesh trying to raise awareness with some influencers on the fairly dire situation with the Rohingya crisis and the refugees there on the Myanmar border, um, influencers back stateside were uh, posting dramatic fashion editorials about their uh, motorcycle crashes sponsored by Smartwater. Um, and I don't feel like I should really uh, have to talk about this much. Um, but I do think that, you know, as an influencer or just a person, I think you have to understand optics in anything that you do. And you have to be able to put yourself into someone else's shoes and be able to view yourself from that person's perspective and ask yourself, how is this going to be perceived? I can't fathom how uh, the influencer who posted those photos of her motorcycle crash thought that was gonna go well. Um, I mean, again, just understanding that like the world is already inclined to hate influencers and think that they're ridiculous. Um, people love like tearing down people. Like look at the, you know, the, what we talked about with the uh, wedding, the like surprise proposal thing, right? People love watching other people suffer, um, especially people that they feel like are more successful or, um, you know, have some level of fame or something that they feel maybe is unwarranted, whatever it might be. People like to see people in positions of success fail and be brought down. Um, and, you know, that was such a driver in that, you know, viral proposal and then the pitch deck, all of that taking off is that it gives people this like perverse joy to see someone's life being kind of like ruined in real time. So, and you have to understand just like how easy those headlines are to write. And so like what looked like a staged motorcycle crash and these like fashion editorial photos, um, which I believe weren't like, I, you know, I looked, I read the article and like I went to her feed after I saw she had deleted the post, but you know, she had photos of her road rash and stuff. Like I do think she probably crashed her bike, um, but you have to understand optics and how it's going to look and before you do something like that, ask yourself, um, you know, ask yourself how that's going to be perceived by the greater public. Because I think thinking about it, which I don't think, she, you know, she thought it through too much, you can't see a world in which people don't find that completely ridiculous. So um, I'm not out here advocating that you should give a shit what anybody says or thinks, but um, if you want to avoid dozens of articles being written about how ridiculous you are. Think about optics um, before you pull a stunt like that. Um, on the flip side, we're talking about her. So, you know, maybe it all worked and, and we're all the morons, I don't know. I have another special announcement. Mm. This is coffee, by the way, don't worry. Um, first of all, Bangladesh, dry country. Um, there's no alcohol there, so I am like feeling 10 years younger after a week off from drinking. Um, but Tim Jeffries, the, who used to be the man behind the camera, I know that's Brian, Tim's now the man next to the camera, um, has been working for years on a feature film on Ryan Hall, who was at one time the, uh, well I guess still is, the greatest American distance, distance runner of all time. Um, Tim followed him in his kind of run up to the London Olympics and filmed him through the aftermath of that, which, you know, if you're not a runner, you probably don't know what happened, so I won't spoil it for you. Um, I've seen the film. It's so good. It is, it is coming out um, over the next few months. You can go to ryanhallfilm.com to look at a preview, 
see where their screenings. He's going to be doing screenings uh, different places around the country. Um, if you've gotten anything from this show over the last few years, um, you know Tim's been a big driver of it. Obviously, it was his idea. Uh, so check out his movie, um, share it around, help Tim become famous, but not so famous that he you know, makes a bunch of money and then quits his job and goes and just makes running movies for the rest of his life. That wouldn't really be great for me. So we want to hit right in the middle where he's feeling like it was a success, but not so much that he leaves his job. So I leave it in your capable hands, people. Let's Thank go to, you. yeah, you're welcome. Um, should we go to questions? First question is not really a question, but I think um, a good time to kind of reflect on the last week in Bangladesh uh, and being out there with influencers. It was, you know, I was out there with Christina Cardona, um, Urban Coy, and Stella Simona. Um, and we were in Dhaka, the uh, capital of Bangladesh, and we went down to Cox Bazaar to the largest refugee camp in the world and visited those for a few days to see the work that Concern Worldwide was doing. Um, incredible perspective shifting trip. Uh, I've never really seen anything like it. I've never been to a proper uh, third world country. Um, you know, I posted a bunch about it on Instagram. I'll continue to do some more posts where I kind of go into greater depth on the work Concern is doing and also I think it's its effect on me. Um, but just speaking from an influencer perspective, I think it is a an interesting balance um, to cover something like that that is um, way outside of the norm. Um, I think you know one of the things that worked so well with the trip is it was such an emotional thing, um, and all the influencers that were there felt a deep connection to you know the crisis in Bangladesh, both in the cities and out in the refugee camps. Um, and the work that the organizations were doing out there. Um, and it was really refreshing, I think, for me to, to kind of see that real emotional connection to the things that they were talking about. Uh, and I think to them as well. Um, I think everyone left the trip feeling refreshed, um, feeling a little better about what they do. And I think it's a good reminder, again, I know we talked about using your following for good and, and the idea of this kind of like, you know, digital philanthropy and, and giving your reach instead of money um, to raise awareness about causes. And I do think there's a moral call to do that. I also think as an influencer, if you're feeling burnt out, if you're feeling disconnected from your work, if you forget why you do this, and you aren't as passionate about it as you used to be, it's a nice way to, to step back and remember that, you know, that reach you have can be used for more than selling product or, you know, making yourself more famous. And I think, you know, as an influencer, um, you need those breaks sometimes. You need those reminders that what you're doing is important and isn't totally vapid or self interested and I don't believe the space is inherently self-interested and obviously I think the work that y'all do is is important and disrespected in the space in the world rather but if you're feeling again if you're if you're feeling a little down about it I think you know we talked we've talked in the past about just taking a break from Instagram um, and seeing kind of the, the change in the influencers this week, I would add to that advice and say that, you know, maybe go out and do something totally different. Do something like one of these trips. There are thousands of NGOs throughout the world doing incredible work. And if you guys can get yourself free rooms at the Four Seasons in Paris, I'm sure you can get yourself to one of these countries or, you know, highlight the work that's happening here in the United States as well. Um, I think you'll find yourself refreshed uh, and feeling kind of ready to get back at your job and, and connected to the work that you do more. So can't suggest it enough for y'all. Um, go out, find a cause that you're passionate about and 
and give your feed over to them and see how you can help. Um, you'll be better for it, we'll be better for it, the world will be better for it. Question two is, uh, how much of a role should management play in coaching or mentoring? I think coaching and mentoring is generally probably a underutilized tool in most people's lives. I think that asking or seeking out coaching or mentorship inherently means you have to admit that maybe you don't know everything, which is hard for a lot of people to admit. Uh, you know, I don't know that much about the manager-influencer relationship. I've talked to amazing managers like Adalia, who I think is incredibly knowledgeable about the space. And um, while she's kind of repping top talent, I'm sure is, you know, helping to guide them and mentor them and make sure they're making the right steps in their career. I've also talked to managers who, you know, are very young and, and don't know that much about the space and, and don't have that much experience. And I worry about the things that they're teaching the influencers. I mean, we have influencers that we really like that we can't work with because their managers are so incompetent. Um, I also think that sometimes in management, influencer management, there is a un do bravado. There's this. There's this feeling that you know they don't really need you, and the influencer doesn't need your business because they're so busy. Um, that's a, a, a pretty terrible attitude to take. So you know, if you have an experienced manager who you look up to, and you can get that person to help coach and mentor you and teach you about these things. I think that's great. Look, if I was an influencer and I was managed, my goal would, to, would be to leave that management eventually, right? Like, you should be teaching yourself those skills and be able to bring it in-house. I mean, if, if you're going to build this into a big business and you're going to do a million dollars a year, you're going to give $200,000 of that away to your management? You know, do you think they're going to bring $200,000 in value? Maybe. but. You could also probably learn those skills, hire someone in-house for a hundred grand, um, and now you've just made a hundred thousand dollars more, and you've brought these things in-house. And I can I promise you that, like, increasingly, brands and agencies are looking at whether people are represented um, and potentially working with people that aren't because it's so much easier, so much faster, and less of a hassle. Um, so I think learning those skills and bringing them in house is, is, if you're interested in coaching and mentorship, that should be the goal. You know, the goal should be to learn from that person and eventually be able to leave and bring it in house. It makes good business sense. Um, it, you know, look at all the top influencers. Most of them have brought those teams in house and are doing it themselves. And I think a manager can be really helpful in guiding you along that way and teaching you. And if they're not letting you in and teaching you about like, hey, why did you answer that email that way? Um, how did you know that you could push them for more money here? Um, how did you learn how to read a contract effectively? Like, mentorship and coaching, end of the day, it all falls on you to ask the questions and to push people. Um, if you've ever read How to Win Friends and Influence People, um, that whole book is predicated on the idea that people love to talk about themselves and if you ask them questions and say, hey, you're an expert and so I would love to know from you X, Y, Z, they will talk forever um, because it makes them feel good, it makes them, you know, feel like they're teaching someone, which people love to do, um, but it's on you to push people and I think if you you know, if you're looking to broaden those skills, just looking to your manager is, is a, you know, is a mistake. You should certainly kind of pull back and look at other people that you respect and try and learn things from them and push them to teach you. And I think we've talked about it before, but if you, if you reach out to someone and you say, hey, I'd love to meet with you, 
you know, you never send the email that says, I'd love to pick your brain. Um, I think people in a position of power get a lot of those emails and it is, it's not super helpful. Um, we've talked before about when you go into those meetings, you need to have a clear agenda of exactly what you want to talk about. You know, keep the small talk to a minimum. Um, the worst thing is when someone's like, I'd love to sit down with you and, and pick your brain and 30 minutes into the conversation, they haven't asked you a single question of consequence and you're like, what the fuck am I doing here? Um, I didn't take this meeting to small talk. Like, so I know when I meet with an influencer, it, you know, after two or three minutes, I'm just like, how can I help you? Like, wh like why are you here? Um, what can I do for you? Because that person probably wants it to be helpful for you um, and you have to push them. They don't know how to be helpful for you. Um, so you have to come prepared uh, with questions. And when you reach out to someone, make sure you frame it in that way. Say, hey, I'm, sh well, I'll say like, I just sent emails like this to a bunch of sales executives that I respect, where I was like, hey, here's a specific thing that my team is struggling with right now. I don't have an answer. I don't know what to do. I thought you might know. Um, so I framed it a little bit to give them some background and said, I'd love to grab 10 minutes of your time to talk about this one thing and nothing else. Um, now, we might talk for 30 minutes and go into other things, but that's so much better for them. They're super busy. I've said, here's a specific thing that I think you might be able to help me with and I don't have an answer to. Um, can we talk for 10 minutes? And infinitely more, like, it's infinitely, an infinitely better email to get than, hey, can I pick your brain? Um, so don't be shy. Uh, the worst thing people can do is say no, you know, if you, if you reach out. I wouldn't also reach out. I've gotten a few of these emails in the past where people are like, hey, I'm looking for a mentor. Would you be interested? That feels like a big responsibility and it's a big ask because I don't know you or the person you're emailing doesn't know you. And so to take you on as a mentor is like, who the fuck has time for that? You know, you have to let that relationship organically grow. Um, and you have to know how much of someone's time you can take and how far you can push them um, because you don't want to come off as too needy. So you have to balance that, you know, that need for you to ask the questions and to ask for what you want and to ask for people's time with knowing that it's, it's generally a marathon, not a sprint, and you should be um, making sure that when you are reaching out to them, it is for a, a very specific reason and you're not wasting too much of their time. So. so last one is, can I elaborate a little bit on the engagement post uh, we made the post that four made about engagement on our Instagram last week did really well. One, you know, we talked a while back about creating content that inspires, educates, or uh, what is it, inspire, educates, entertains. or entertains, right? And I asked the marketing team to, you know, to, to kind of take that advice, our own advice, and try and do posts that you know, we felt like our Instagram was too self-promotional. It was just talking a lot about the things we were doing. I think it kind of happened over time because we were doing so many more things and we felt like everything that we were doing deserved an Instagram post. So the Instagram became this place where we were just saying, hey, we're doing this, look at us, go to this thing, we did this thing. Um, and it wasn't super valuable for influencers. And so you know, we're taking a kind of new philosophy and saying anything that we do, whether it's, you know, a, a podcast, a foreground, a drink with James, um, anything, we're trying to make sure that it's beneficial to influencers. Just the same advice that I am giving y'all. Um, our Instagram is performing quite a bit better than it, it has ever um, with that simple shift. And we're still promoting the things we're doing. It's just, again, like, when we interview someone for foreground, instead of saying, hey, today we have a new foreground up with this person, we pull out what we think are the um, most helpful and valuable insights from that interview and 
give that away without having to dive into the content. Now, hopefully you see that and you say, oh, I'm gonna go check that out. But if you didn't, it's still gonna help you and you're gonna learn something rather than learn there's a new podcast up. Learning there's a new podcast up isn't valuable. Learning the most salient point from that podcast is really valuable. So that stuff has worked really well for us. We had our best performing post ever last week um, very simply just talking about engagement, you know, we looked at the 85,000 influencers we have and the engagement rates across all the follower counts and, you know, showed, I think, a trend that, that most of you probably assumed was true, um, but that micro-influencers are getting exponentially more engagement um, than larger influencers. Um, what's that first group? Is it 0 to 25? Zero to 25. So on the zero to 25,000 followers, it's, it's 9% is the average, and above a million, it's something like 2 point, and above a million, it's something like 2.2%. So micro-influencers getting four or five times as more engagement than the largest influencers. And, you know, I think we've talked a bit about this before, but Facebook, we'll zoom out and talk about Facebook. Facebook knows that that platform is all about connecting with family and friends and sharing photos. And it is why any platform that emerges that people are sharing photos, family and friends, they will do anything to buy it. So WhatsApp, you know, there was a stat that came out right before Facebook bought WhatsApp that was like more photos were being sent through WhatsApp every day than were being published to Instagram. And like a month later, they bought it for $20 billion. Um, there was like eight people working at that company when they bought it. Um, they knew that any platform that comes around that's, that people are sharing photos with their family is a, is a threat to Facebook that they cannot take lightly. Um, it's why they bought Instagram. It's why they ripped off Snapchat. Um, it's why they're now working to rip off TikTok. So for micro-influencers, you know, it looks like the algorithm, the way it works is that, you know, if you're under a certain level, certainly if you're under a thousand followers, they're assuming your following is mostly friends and family, and they want to make sure that that content reaches your friends and family um, because that is the, you know, that's the, the core of the platform. While we sit every week and we talk about y'all's world, you're in the 1%. You know, you're in the top, top, top uh, of, of followings on Instagram. Most people just have a few hundred followers and are sharing photos with their friends and families and colleagues. And Instagram wants to make sure those photos get to those people so that the platform stays sticky. Because if you have 300 followers and you post a photo and they're getting the same reach and they only 20% saw that. Um, okay, so that's 90 people. You know, that's gonna just be a bummer. Um, and you're probably, because you're not using Instagram for your job, you might be less likely to use it. So it makes sense that the smaller the following, the more people are seeing it. The other thing is I think a psychological one of if someone has five or 10,000 followers, you as a follower, feel a lot more connected with that person because if you send a DM or you like a post or comment on it, you can be pretty sure that that person is going to see that comment, that like, that DM. Um, it feels more like a relationship. If I like Kim Kardashian's posts, which I do all the time, I know for a fact she's never gonna see that like. If I comment on every photo, she's probably never gonna see those comments. She's never gonna go to my profile. We're never gonna you know, have a relationship on this platform. But for smaller influencers, that's certainly true. So I think, you know, what you can learn from that is understanding the kind of core philosophy of the platform and what is working. And the influencers that we see who are doing really well, they're not as focused on the next follower. They're answering their DMs. They're engaging in the comments. Um, they're acting like a smaller influencer. So, you know, there's only so much you can do to buck the way the platform is built, but learn from what is working, 
And if you're not a micro-influencer anymore, congratulations. It doesn't mean that you can't try and act like one and engage like one. Um, it's certainly exhausting to do so, but um, give it a try. Um, again, this is kind of where we're seeing a lot of, of success come from on Instagram are those influencers who are super invested in their existing audience. So if you haven't seen that post, check it out. We are doing these four-year information, four information posts more often on our Instagram. Um, we have an in-house data scientist on the team now who's kind of helping Tim and the marketing team pull together these really cool insights. Um, so if you don't follow us, you definitely should. Uh, there is some cool stuff coming out um, every week on there. So it is now 10.03. I have to get my day started and have a good week.